I was just saying to my husband, he says, maybe you'll recognize this. You know how you ask a man, what are you thinking? And they say nothing. It's true, except for these four things. <laughs> Sleep, sex, football, and food. And not necessarily in that order. Even when you're at the age where you can live without sex but not in your glasses. So food <laughs> is at the top of, he's literally saying on the way here today what he was gonna have for lunch tomorrow. So I defer to my Epicurean here. On but it's food. called the, the five F's of Louisiana. Faith, food, football, family, and fixing flats. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a couple of things. Uh, my wife they, they just reopened the Caribbean room in the Punch Train Hotel, which is a really nice experience for going something a little high end. It was a very famous restaurant that was damaged in the in the flood, and so people came in and sort of redid it in that old kind of grand tradition. So that's wait, not some people, not general. John Besh and Cooper Manning of the football fame, and John Besh, who right. is the restaurant, the chef of the year every year, James Beard won. Uh, Katie's, which is a neighborhood restaurant, uh, about 30 blocks from here maybe, is really in, uh, you know, more neighborhoody, not, not that expensive, you know, real uh, New Orleans experience. Uh, any of the, if you like seafood, if you like fish, a place not very far from here called Pesh, E-P-C-H-E, -E, really good. A little pricier, but, but uh, a Donald Lake restaurant, and they, they grill. They have a special kind of flaming oven, and they grill the fish whole in that. It's all fresh golf fish. Uh, I one of my favorites is, is is a place in deep, deep uptown New Orleans, a Creole Italian place called Vincent's. But those, are, and, and, but but the thing about the food here is there are no bad restaurants because there are just so many you you would go out of business in three weeks. I mean, you just cannot. The, the competition is so. Ferocious. Uh, there's a place, not, another place, not very far from that I love, called the Bonton, which is a real Louisiana country style restaurant, more of a country cooking. But, but there's a thousand of them, you know. We get in trouble. I always get in trouble. So I say, hey, why didn't you mention another place? But those are some of my favorites. And the two Louisiana, New Orleans must see one of never going to come here again, which would be a mistake. But Commanders and Brennan's is real, which is. Go to the no. Yeah, and the, the World War II museum is yeah, really going. good. Going and they have a, a good, that, that is really something worth seeing. Yeah, did I tell you we're going there on Friday night? You can still get tickets, I think. And we're going to do a march from here over to the World War II Museum. And I think we have a door. Second line. Band it's a second line, not a march. It's go what? Second line, and you have to wait. Okay. Hankies, All right. hankies, or whatever, so. We're, we're doing, doing a second that line. That is really worth your time. The second line. We got married here, and we did a second line from our ceremony to our restaurant, which my Yankee father did not quite understand. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you haven't been in the second line, it's different. Did he pay for the wedding? So that's all right. No, we were uh, 40 and 49. And his family said when he brought me home, the first girl she, he's brought home that's of age. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> they were used to backwards hat, baseball hats and sitting in his lap and everything. And um, so and I proposed to him, got him the ring, sent it to his secretaries, get, told him what to say, not that I'm bossy. But you got to take control with these guys, and whoops, I rest my case. Um, I do not dress him. Um, what was the question? No, I, I, there you I, go. Sorry. So I got to, is Megan out there? You, we have questions for you from the audience, and I'm Megan, oh, wait. counting can I, once. Can I say something before we start? Sure. I. Thank you for coming to New Orleans. It's 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 dear to our hearts. I just said you, you did get married here, but thank you for what you do. What, uh, that, the question I didn't even know what your name was, but Greg. not you, ADHD, oh, physiatry. But you, if I could finish that sentence, I would say physiatry is hope. My 
brother who had a previously undetected spinal cord compression which manifested in a dirt bike accident and he was paralyzed from C3 down. So they did the expanded his, well, the doctors with the halo and this would say, this kid, he's never, this kid, he's younger than me, but only five years. Prime of his life, very physically fit, a single father with two young kids. He's never gonna walk in, he's never doing anything. Well, that's not, so my sister was a, a, a special ed teacher and I was in the White House and we, we tagged him back and forth to make sure he had, and we didn't, and they say he'll never get out of his bed again, we'll get the halo out of him. But it's not, I'm a sister running, where there's light, there's hope. So we finally found, I didn't know it was a physiatrist, right? That was a rehab thing, but the rehab, it's way more than that, it's so holistic. They, with with your help, with the old holistic, sure. everything, more than, this kid now, who could not do anything, in fact, he said to my sister, can you pick my nose? And I said, I'm not doing that. You can do that part. Don't you? He is now a fully functional, walking, talking, baseball coaching. I mean, it's, it's, and it's, so it's more, it, it is complete hope. So thank you, thank you. I, don't, I know you hear this all the time, but thank you for what you do. Yeah, I couldn't. I could. I, could, I couldn't agree more. I, I went to visit him in, 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 several times. He was in the Northwestern University Hospital in downtown Chicago. I said, "This guy is never going to walk out of this place." Yeah, and he did. And he's been not only now he's running now. He's up and running full speed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you have a niece that's also part of the rehab team, an occupational therapist. So, oh, great. Carrying on the work. So, Paul, do you have uh, questions for? Is the mic on there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, to get the conversation started, I know a lot of people, Mary and James, would like to hear from your political perspective, sort of the state of the race right now is we're just 19 days <laughs> Not that. Not that. There is that campaign. Uh, oh my God, I don't know what you're talking about, Paul. <laughs> Paul is our, our former neighbor and still friend who's a public servant for 15 years, so. You feeling our pain, friend? You feeling our pain? Just a little bit. Well, every four years we do this, and you know, we come out, we have good people here, and we try to build up some suspense, yeah. and you know, we, it, it's in the hands of the voters now, the draft debate is over, it's the home stretch, uh, what's gonna happen on election night? <clears throat> we know what's gonna happen on election night. <laughs> I mean, it, this, the question here, is what's going to happen after the election? I mean, is the guy going to have some kind of guerrilla warfare and go and like, or, or what's going to happen to the Republican Party after the election? I mean, this election, I mean, let's not kid ourselves, this thing is not going to be close. I mean, it, I don't, I actually kind of, and in, in a way, like you guys, and all of my Republican friends all come up to me and say, James, what, what the hell can we do? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, if you're asking me, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, uh, it, it is, a, it, it, people always say the same thing. Have you ever seen anything like this? And no. <laughs> I never have. I, I never thought I'd see somebody stand in front of 50, 60 million people and say, well, I don't know if I'm going to accept the result of the election or not. We'll just have to wait and see the election. I mean, it's kind of characteristic of, Amer of American democracy that, you know, you have an election, you, you kind of call the person and you, you vow to go back and get them again in four years. But that's such as not to, and there's so many things about this race that are so unique. And the, and usually, you know, look, if things happen every four years, we get out of breath, we say, here we stand, we're on the precipice, we look into the abyss, it's not us who have not now win the fate of, fate of the free world or something hangs in the balance. And it's always been like a, Dallas Cowboys had a running back named Dwayne Thomas who in the middle of all the Super Bowl hype said, what if the Super Bowl is the ultimate game? How can they play it again next year? <laughs> but this is like nothing, there's no historical reference for this. 
and no one even knows what's going to happen to the Republican Party. I mean, the political party was founded in 1854, and, you know, 60, 160 years, I guess, if you do the math right, something like that. And no one knows if they're even going to exist or, or what form are they going to exist in. And that's a kind of a remarkable event. I mean, it, 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 so we're, we're in a, I, mean, I don't think, you know, it doesn't, it feels like the aftermath of this election, the, the three weeks after might be even more interesting than the three weeks before. I just checked my, uh, you know, cell phone before I got up here and knew it. Apparently, Joe Scarborough, who was a Republican Congress of Florida, and Bill Crystal got, almost got in a fist fight this morning on television <laughs> arguing about this. And I think that we, you're going to see, you're going to see a lot more of this, and, and it's not going to end with election day. Um, I'm not saying this is a partisan. But I am surprised at that answer because I know James is a great student of history. Of course, there's myriad, uh, the history's replete with this, we've been through this before. To make a political application off of your uh, changes coming, change is certain, progress is not. The whole history of humankind is adaptation and change. That this uh, change is is being viewed in a new paradigm in the knowledge age, and so we have so many different venues to, and we're, we're forced, but it makes it feel like it's different because we're hearing it differently and we also are allowed to hear only our side effects that we choose to hear. So, but oh, he, oh, you mentioned Cicero, politics is human nature and this is what happened in your other concern, your other point about tumult is opportunity. Political tumult is real opportunity. So I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not scared. I mean, would, I'm not scared if Hillary wins because she's not going to have any party unity because she's not having any coattails. She doesn't have any, uh, she's not going to have a honeymoon. She's not going to have a kumbaya because she thinks the other side is deplorable and irredeemable. And no one's afraid of her as they were of Obama. I'm just, I'm saying this in 40 years in Washington, okay? Let me stipulate, I am not defending Trump, who is not a conservative, he's not a Republican. I will say, uh, perhaps, memory loss is a, is an office, is some, 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 has something to do with ADHD because it was only in 2000 and Al Gore was weeks preceding the election, briefing reporters on the electoral system and how they we're anticipating ha possibly having to protest the outcome. Okay, so I don't know why you're all kind of getting those in a knot over this. But <laughs> the larger, to the, have we seen anything like this before? Yes, our history, we were born. This, we were founded like this. The Republican Party was born of the collapse of the Whig Party. This Republican Party has been in a, a decline as a representative of of the, of the decentralized, more limited form of, of government. So Trump is not the disease, he's the symptom. We made him by not being responsive to that philosophy of good. So in a way, he, he, he just accelerated what's gonna happen. She has stalled, Mrs. Clinton has stalled what needs to happen and this has to happen because we're it's not you're going through change the world's going through change we're in a knowledge economy which is completely we're in a generational change millennials now outnumber baby boomers so there's a, that we're in a global strategic security uh, a completely new paradigm so everything is changing and the the most uh <clears throat> laborious that is going to happen at all it, uh, change is in government. It's antiquated and it's resistant to change and it's sclerotic to use one of your words. So I'm not, yes, you've seen it before and you know it as a history person. You're, you're, you're studying the Civil War right now, honey, so I don't know where you got that. As for Joe Scarborough and Bill Crystal fighting, hoo ha. I mean, who would. I mean, the, look, it's just an indignity. The Democrats will have won six out of the last seven presidential elections. 
did a trick. And every time he changes, the Republicans say, we don't need to change, it, it was some extraneous thing that cost us to lose. And, you know, Mitch McConnell said something, don't give him credit for much, but he said in Kentucky, as a saying, the best education is the second kick of a mule. <laughs> He's getting ready to kick again. And, uh, you know, they can go back and, and rethink their thing, or they can keep on going. It just, that's what it is. It's, you know, insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, and it never works. We're not doing that, nor did I say we were going to do that. I think I just said, and put my money where my mouth is, I re-registered as a libertarian. Because there is no Republican Party. There's one party. There's the power party, and then there's people, the party that gets things done, like we did here in New Orleans. Like what you're going through. How do we adapt in this fast, with these tools in this fast changing world? And that party's, neither party is adapting and, and neither is the government. You have to be on the ground being patient centered, if you will, like we, our mayors had to do here, governors have to do. That's what federalism is. And that works. And I, I want to say again, because I saw so many millennials here, this millennial generation is amazing. Despite all the bad stuff we hear about them, 88% of them think the best, our best is this country is ahead. They are the wholly uh, in, in, encased in the, in the knowledge age. So they know how to use these tools and they think like they use their ADHD to, you know, to, they harness it and they put it in you. So I'm very positive about the future. So we have four more years of tumult, no matter who's in there. It's a, it's a crook or the kook. You pick. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, again, that's all that's true. I love young people, and the election is going to be a wipeout. <laughs> and they'll put, yeah. Okay. Dr. Orsowitz, so, question. So Paul, was uh, that to make us feel good that we're not under near the pressure of political people are? <laughs> Next question. Uh, Dave Welch, I'm from Northern New York in Lake Placid. Where, where Lake Placid? Lake Placid. Yeah, I don't want to go through the Geneva, which is a little south of here. But... Yep. Uh, my concern is that as we look at the academy, we're trying to plan for the future. And having been on the board, we were trying to look 20 years out. In the slides we saw earlier, we're looking 5, 10, and 15 years out. Other industries are doing the same thing. We talk about trying to rebuild our infrastructure, build highways, dams, roads, bridges, etc. With the turmoil in Washington and the turmoil even in the state level, the problem I see is that there is no way that anybody can do long term planning. And so the question is how do we straighten out our governmental process? so that we can have long-term planning and get away from a two-year election cycle or a one-year cycle or a quarterly annual report cycle for business. Do I? I'll go. Go ahead. I, I'll go. I, in its current incarnation, you can't. It can't because it's, I forget what you know this for a cause becomes a business becomes a scam. The government's at the scam age. I forget the literal thing. There, what can change it is this infusion of this next generation and a different paradigm, a different thought, uh, an organizing principle. Your organizing principle, their or, your organizing principle is outcome based. That's what I'm advocating. And when this is over, and we, from the ashes, try to pull out two parties again, uh, and what the governors who are succeeding and the mayors who are succeeding, they're outcome-based. You look at the whole picture, if it's working, or you, okay, that's, what, they don't, they're not outcome-based. They're, let's do more of the same, so long as there's plenty in it for me and I keep getting reelected. I'm not trying to be a cynic about it, the, the founders, foresaw this, Cicero foresaw this, Socrates foresaw, I mean, it's not, it's human nature. So that, but the outcome-based model and organizing principle that is becoming the modus operandi for all other sectors of our civilization is ultimately going to impact this one from the ground up. And I, so again, I'm, I'm sort of reiterating, what I said previously, but for now, 
what the way voters are are trying to impact the, what you want to have, have happened is not electing people, electing leaders, they're unelecting failures. So in, in this, in what is novel in this, maybe you can, Mr. Polster, you can, you can correct me, I don't think there's ever been two national candidates with as uh, high and as deep, if you will, negatives. So the, it's a, the, the political paradigm is we're just trying to, it's a succession of getting rid of the bums instead of electing leaders. Well, first of all, the infrastructure question, I, I, I will never understand that in a period where we had uber low interest rates and very low demand and great, very great infrastructure needs, why we didn't, you know, spend two trillion dollars. I do think that's one of the things that that will happen when she's elected. I think I think there's a sufficient number of Republicans that want this to happen. It may not happen on the scale that 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 I would want, but but I do think this is becoming a big issue. And you have having like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Manufacturers Association, the contractors, the, 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 the auto dealers. I mean, they're, they're getting to be. You can feel a real push for infrastructure in the United States. Uh, how it's how they set it up with the you know how much of it is private how much of it is public there's a lot of ideas about bringing some of this tax money from back and, and having invested in that there's some talk about doing five-year budgets as opposed to one-year budgets i mean there's a lot of things you can do but but you're, you're absolutely correct that we have unbelievable infrastructure needs and most people me being one of them actually doesn't think it, it, it's like fixing the roof you're really not spending the money because you have to fix the roof anyway. So uh, I, I, there are a couple of things that I think that, that you could see about, I think it would be a tough slog when she's president. I think partisanship is a, is a real issue in the country. But I, if I had to guess one thing where you would see some progress, it, it, would, uh, it would be on that. Uh, but it, it, there, there's no question that we're in an era of, of hyper-partisanship I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see it ending in any time in the near future. May I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my apologies. I, I misunderstood your question. I thought you meant the infrastructure politics. As for physical infrastructure, why Hillary would have a better stimulus idea for infrastructure than her predecessor, where not one piece of infrastructure was attended to, one has to ask that question. But is there, do we need to upgrade it? Yes, we just spent billions of dollars here for which our mayor gets no credit because it's all the underground infrastructure. In Virginia, what do we call it? Call it spaghetti bowl. Okay, there's so many. So the- and that's all federal money. But it's being run by the states, and I don't know why it has to go to the feds to come back to the states in the first place, where so much is absorbed by a bureaucracy that has nothing to do with it. All infrastructure money goes to the states. I mean, all, if, you build, if, if, if you build, the, if you get a, a grant to build a sewage system, the federal government doesn't build a sewage system, the sewage and water board builds. I understand, I, mean, that. I understand that, honey. Okay. Okay. You're not hearing me, which okay. he can't hear, and I don't listen, so let's move on. Okay, we have our next question.